Bienvenidos. Hello and welcome to City Breaks Seville, Episode 2, The Alcazar. Surely one of the most memorably beautiful buildings in the whole of Spain, if not Europe, or perhaps the world. And quite a statement really when you think how many other beautiful buildings there are in Seville. The Cathedral, the Giralda, the other palaces, etc. But somehow the Alcazar, I think, is particularly special. That combination of the ancient walls and the great mix of cultures that you find as soon as you step inside, Islamic, Gothic, Renaissance, all of that, before we even get to the glorious gardens, that lovely oasis of greenery and pathways and water and plants. Somewhere you can lose yourself and imagine yourself back in Moorish Seville, a lovely garden in which to meditate while the tinkling fountains are all around you. Quite lovely. So then, the plan for the episode, a little bit of history, focusing on why it is that there are so many different styles in this building, touching on some of the major personalities who are connected with it. I think my favourite two might be, at least from their names, Alfonso the Wise and Pedro the Cruel. Certainly going to mention some of the things there are to see, but not in massive detail. I think really you want to wander around and just enjoy it and look and see what you see when you get to it, rather than trying to remember a whole lot of dates and facts. But I'll do my best. And then to finish, a quick word about Moorish influence generally in Seville. OK then, so the history. Well, you might remember from episode one how many different groups of people have come and gone in southern Spain. If we start for these purposes by waving off the Romans, and just note that after them came the Visigoths, and then get straight to the year 711 AD, when the Moors arrived in Gibraltar. One Tariq ibn Ziyad arrived with 10,000 men, landed in Gibraltar, took that pretty swiftly, and then they moved on to the mainland, and before too many years, actually they controlled most of the Iberian Peninsula. And while they were about it, they renamed southern Spain and called it Al-Andalus. That's where we get the name Andalusia from, of course, today. By 929, they had established an independent caliphate. They had named the city of Cordoba as being their capital, and that became, in fact, the greatest city in Europe for well over a century, a centre of art and science and all kinds of scholarship. It collapsed, though. Various factions feuded against each other, and by 1086, along came the North Africans. A people who became known as the Almohads from Morocco took over southern Spain, and they made Seville their capital. So that's the point at which this becomes important for the Alcazar. They called the city Isbilia, so you can hear how that transformed then into Sevilla, and Seville as we call it. So Seville at that point then is very much a Moorish stronghold. In the 13th century though, the Christians from the north arrived in Andalusia, and they began taking over. Seville itself was recaptured by the Christians in 1248, But this wasn't the beginning of a whole new era exactly, because many of the Muslim population stayed on. They became known as the Mudéhar, and they continued to play a key role in influencing things like design. Often when buildings were put up, craftsmen and builders were borrowed, literally actually, as you'll hear in a minute, because people respected their skills and liked the things which they produced. 1492 is probably a date you know, if you know any Spanish history because that's when Columbus set off, you may know the verse, across the ocean blue, etc. But it's also a key date, because it was the year when the last Moorish outpost in southern Spain fell to the Christians, the point at which the Christian kings, Ferdinand and Isabella, ruled then over the whole of Spain. The Reconquista, as it's called in Spanish. So all of that had an impact on the building that we're thinking about today, the Alcazar. When I opened the guidebook you actually buy on site there, I noticed the very first sentence said, quote, A thousand years of art and history overlap in a fortress that was designed to protect a strategic enclave. So telling you that the Alcazar is there at all, because Seville was such a strategic place and needed to be defended, and it is as it is because of the thousand years of art and history, all the different people who fed into designing it. It was begun in the 11th century, when... Seville took over from Cordoba as being the capital of the region. Obviously strong defences were needed, and so the Alcazar walls were built. The Almohads extended it very much. They wanted a fancy residence, so they began the palace. Lots of additions, lots of enlargements. 
and it was then at that point very much a palace on Islamic lines. And a very beautiful one at that. When in 1248 Seville was retaken by Ferdinand and Isabella, that was the end of five centuries of Muslim rule, but it wasn't the end of the palace because Ferdinand in particular fell in love with it, decided he'd move straight in and live there, and as he put it himself, his aim in life was to, quote, die under its roof, which he did. And actually it's interesting to note that when he was buried, his inscription on his tomb referred to him as the Rey de las Tres Religiones, so King of the Three Religions, so actually marking the fact that he ruled over a city that was Christian, yes, but also Muslim, and of course the third group, the Jews. His son and heir, Alfonso X, also loved the palace, he wasn't moving out, and his reign was very much remembered as a time of scholarship and learning. His nickname, in fact, is Alfonso the Wise, or in some textbooks, Alfonso the Learned. One of his many interests was languages, good man, and he made sure that lots of works were translated from Arabic and Latin into the vernacular, the Castilian language, which meant firstly that the learning in those tomes came Spain's way, and also it was instrumental in making Castilian the main language of learning and science and law. He was a poet too. He wrote a volume called the Cantigas de Santa Maria, very musical poems. In fact, I think he did musical notation as, alongside. He had science interests. And he's not being learned or wise, he's being an astrologer, to the point where he had a crater on the moon named after him, the Alphonsus Crater. He was very interested in law as well, and he wrote the first Spanish law codes, something called the Siete Partidas. So the whole palace then in that era would have been a centre of learning and scholarship, people visiting, bringing their ideas, discussing with other people. But while all that was going on, he was also making additions to the palace this time in a Gothic style, so leaving what was there, all the Islamic architecture, but adding in a layer of something more contemporary. So, so far then, we've had two architectural styles, Islamic and Gothic. The next one is called the Mudehar, so relating to the fact that so many Muslims had stayed on in Seville, and they were being asked to lend their skills to carry on building and refining the palace. That happened under Pedro the Cruel, he became king very young, I think he was only 15 in about 1350 when he came to the throne. He'd grown up in the Alcazar and that had given him a tolerance for everything Islamic and a love particularly of the architecture that surrounded him, most of which the Muslims had created. He cultivated friendships with many high-ranking Muslims, not least the Muslim ruler in Granada, the Emir of Granada, and when he was adding to his palace, Pedro used to send to Granada and ask to borrow carpenters, builders, etc., and have them come and do his extensions and his decorating. So that's why the palace in his time is known as the Mudejar Palacio de Don Pedro. So Don Pedro's Mudejar Palace, that blend, fusion of Spanish and Islamic styles. This is illustrated, actually, by the inscriptions on the facade of the palace. So you can read, at one point, that the building's creator is, quote, the very high, noble and conquering Don Pedro, by the grace of God, King of Castilla and Leon. And alongside that, in Arabic script, you have the inscription, There is no conqueror but Allah. So the two religions coexisting. Pedro it was who had one of the most beautiful parts of the entire palace built, namely the Patio de las Doncellas, so the Patio of the Maidens, it's normally called in English guidebooks, which is a gorgeous sunken garden surrounded by exquisite arches and lovely decorative plasterwork and tiling, showing, in short, its Islamic influence in all areas. It's said, I don't know if it's true, that the Patio de las Doncellas is so called because it refers to the legend that Moors in previous eras had demanded a hundred virgins a year as a tribute from the Christian kingdoms in Iberia. But in his favour, it must be said, that Pedro took over a palace where there had always been a harem, but which he chose not to use, apparently. He is said to have had just, in inverted commas, the one concubine, one Maria de Padilla, and apparently people were so astounded by this that the gossip was that she must be using witchcraft to keep him faithful. Because what other reason could there possibly be? Let's move forward in history a little bit to the era of Isabel and Ferdinand, 
who married in 1479, uniting two of Spain's most powerful kingdoms, and who from 1492 onwards, once Granada was also taken back, ruled over the whole of Spain. And they chose to make the Alcazar here in Seville one of their strongholds. So during that era, it was playing a very important role in Spanish history. This, of course, was the golden age when all that money was pouring into Seville in the form of gold, mainly, from the New World, and they used much of it to refurbish the Alcazar. By this stage, we're into Renaissance style, so lots more marble columns. They adapted the Muslim gardens, made them much more European. And probably the most important thing that they did was they set up something called the Casa de la Contratación here, which you can think of as really the logistics centre for the empire that they were running. World's first global empire, really, all run from Seville. More about this in a subsequent episode. But they managed to create a monopoly and to say that all goods coming from America had to come via Seville, so they kept their finger very much on the pulse and in the till, presumably, as well. So they set up a centre. When you go today, it's called the Admiral's Quarters. Again, more about this in the episode on the Golden Age. But it was the place from which everything to do with the New World happened. So laws were drafted there to regulate the trade. Navigators were trained. Map makers were trained. It was here that the King and Queen would hold their audiences with explorers. So seeing Christopher Columbus, for example, before he set off, and more importantly, once he returned. So here it was that they would negotiate with him over what they would pay for and what they expected in return. And when he did return, it was to hear that he would come to tell them all the news of what he'd found and how much money he'd made. Those then are the main eras in which the Alcazar was built or added to in significant ways. In the 19th century, there was a renewed interest in things of the past. Parts of the palace which had fallen into disrepair were restored very much as they hoped in the original Islamic style. But I don't know if you could say that that was always totally successful. So then, if you go round, what can you expect to see? Oh my goodness, so much. I think I might choose perhaps 1% of the whole thing to just mention briefly, the highlights, if you will, because otherwise the podcast will never end. And you will lose the will to listen, possibly go, possibly live. I've already mentioned one of the massive highlights, which would be the Maiden's Courtyard. And I think most people would agree that the other most imposing, most stunningly beautiful part of the building is the part called the Ambassador's Hall, which was used by Peter I, Pedro the Cruel, if you prefer, as a throne room. It's about 100 metres square in size and it's sumptuously decorated. Think columns, horseshoe arches a golden dome which represents the heavens. There's the peacock arch, for example, with birds decorating it. That gets you into the room. In each direction, then, you've got these lovely arched entrances to further rooms, all decorated in white and blue and gold. A gallery all the way around, where the balconies are supported by golden dragons. Feels a bit like being in a fairy tale, really. There's also a gallery with portraits of all the Castilian kings. An absolute highlight, for sure. I might just mention one more place inside, the Prince's Suite, which is a rectangular room with archways at each end and little bedrooms off them. That was the way in which they used to provide privacy. So fewer walls and doors, but areas sectioned off by archways. This room was used as Isabella's bedroom and was the room where she gave birth to their only son and heir, one Juan of Aragon. I think little details like that allow you to fix the idea in your mind that these really were real people. You might also like to know that when the present royal family, or anyone connected with them, comes to Seville, this is where they stay, on this upper floor of the Alcazar, in the suite of rooms known as the Prince's Suite. There is so much more inside to see. You can wander through archways and up tiled corridors, at your heart's desire really. But eventually, I suggest, you go outside two the most fantastic, glorious, beautiful gardens that you may ever see. Think pathways and fountains and statues, pavilions. Again, like the palace, it's Islamic in flavour, but not exclusively because so much has been added and changed over the years. But I think you can say that it was the period of Muslim rule that really set the pattern for how the gardens were going to be. They were there for two reasons. 
Firstly, to provide fresh food to the household, of course, but much more than that, for aesthetic reasons. You may know that in the Quran, the garden is often referred to as a kind of paradise, a suitable place for reflection, somewhere to meditate, somewhere quiet and peaceful, and definitely very beautiful. So it was designed with all of that in mind. There'd be fragrant herbs and flowers to stimulate the senses. A lot of geometric patterns. So straight pathways opening up into little square areas with perhaps a fountain in the middle. The trees were often planted in a geometric fashion. A lot of water was used. Yes, for its cooling properties, but also because pond water stimulates reflection. Fountains and water jets make a soothing sound. So the whole thing is designed as a whole to be a little piece of paradise on earth. And I would say that atmosphere definitely has lasted right up until today. Of course things have been added. I think one of my favourites is the vaulted baths where it is said that Maria de Padilla, who was the lady who kept Pedro the Cruel in check, liked to bathe outside. So then, for fear of overload, I'm not going to go up and down every single path. I'm going to leave it there and turn to the accounts of three travellers who visited the Alcazar in different eras and wrote about it. Starting with Richard Ford, who wrote a two-volume work called A Handbook for Travellers in Spain, published in the 1830s. He was quite an intrepid explorer, actually. He rode across the country on a horseback. I think he covered 2,000 miles in total. It took him three years, and he wrote about many of the places where he stopped. And his book is a mixture of all sorts of things. Certainly a traveller's handbook, as per the title. He tells you where he went and what it was like. You get quite a lot of little historical details pertaining to wherever he is. And you get quite a lot of Richard Ford and his opinions. I think it'd be safe to say he didn't like everything, but he could be quite witty explaining why he didn't like certain things. But there are places where he certainly absolutely loved what he saw. So, by way of example, here he is, to start with, just explaining why this lovely building is called an Alcazar at all. Quote, The term Alcazar signifies a royal palace. The word is Moorish, or rather Roman, for Alcazar is simply Caesar, whose name was synonymous with majesty. So explaining then that even in the name, this mix of cultures is there again, from the Roman Caesar through the Arabic Alcazar, to the Spanish word Alcazar. And in that same chapter, he explains why it was that Pedro I thought it was better to borrow Islamic builders from his friend, the Emir of Granada, than to use his own builders. And he does manage to be quite dismissive about the sort of people he might have had to use to work for him if he hadn't had the chance of getting the Islamic builders who really knew what they were doing. OK, so this is what he writes. The Grand Portal is quite Moorish, Yet it was built in 1364 by Don Pedro, the great restorer of this palace. At this point, the elaborate oriental decorations of the Alhambra were just completed by Yusuf I, and Pedro, who was frequently on the best of terms with the Moors of Granada, desirous of adopting that style, employed Moorish workmen, just as the Christian Norman kings in Sicily did Sarsenic ones, from want of sufficient taste and talent among their own ruder subjects. I'm not quite sure whether that dismissiveness is Pedro's or, more likely, I suspect, Richard Ford's. But anyway, it's quite amusing to read and it is explaining an important point. In the 19th century, what with romanticism and everything, many travellers were absolutely bowled over by places like the Alcazar. And here's an account from one Eugène Poitou, presumably a Frenchman, which he wrote after his visit in 1873. He starts by telling us how stunned he is by the beauty of the place. Quote, one thinks oneself in a palace of fairies. One is astonished, charmed, dazzled. The wall seems clothed in a guipier of gold and silk. I do not think the Moors have ever been equalled in the art of internal decoration. In spite of the profusion of ornament which covers the halls up to the very roof, and even the roof itself, there is neither heaviness nor overloading, nor a gaudy abundance of richness in the marvellous whole, so varied and so elegant are the forms. But he does have a criticism. He notices that lots of paintings have been introduced more recently, and I think he wonders whether perhaps they don't quite fit in. The colours are a bit too bright, a bit too garish, 
And then he thinks, oh, well, maybe I've just come to see them too early. And in a century or two, they will have quietened down a bit and fit in better with the lovely Islamic decorations that I so admire. Anyway, he puts it better than I can, and this is what he wrote. Only in its present condition, and after its recent restoration, the Alcazar has perhaps a single defect. The paintings are too gorgeous, the colours are too vivid, the tones too hard. Is this the fault of the modern artists, who have not possessed the faculty of communicating to their work that harmony, so noticeable in the work wrought by Moorish hands? Or is it simply that time has not yet given to the two vivid colours that subdued tint which he gives to everything? And then finally, jumping ahead to the 20th century, here's one H. V. Morton, who visited Seville in the 1950s and was particularly taken with the gardens. So first of all, he's writing about something he spotted in the gardens, which he finds to be quite an amusing little joke, writing, quote, Here was the Seville one reads about. The orange trees, the roses, the hedge of box and myrtle, the cypresses and the fish ponds. There was a delightfully juvenile water trap in a little garden where the king could drench his guests with jests of water from the paving beneath his feet. A typical Arab jest. Actually, I think, didn't Louis the Fourteenth do exactly the same at Versailles and a whole host of other monarchs in all sorts of other palaces? But anyway, he noticed it there and it does underline that playful aspect to these beautiful gardens. And then he goes on to explain how he sat there imagining all the gardeners over the centuries and how hard they must have worked, planting and digging up and altering and transferring, as he put it. And there follows a long list of some of the things that he most enjoyed, which reads like this. Charles V and Philip II dug, planted and improved, made pavilions, reservoirs and even a maze. And in later times, other kings introduced Baroque novelties, such as dripping grottos, garden gates, wall fountains, and rusticated stonework. There was a beautiful fish pond with a little bronze mercury rising in the centre, as if he were in Italy. The flower beds were gay with cannas and agapanthus. Plumbago was in flower, so was jasmine, and I sat on a seat covered with Moorish tiles beneath one of the largest magnolia glandifora I had ever seen. I hope then that I've managed to convey something of the lovely atmosphere of the whole palace and the gardens and perhaps encouraged you to go and have a look. I'd like to finish the episode with just a little note on some of the Arabic influences left in Spain, particularly those which relate to building. What are the Islamic features of a building which you expect to find here in the Alcazar and in so many other buildings in Seville and all over southern Spain? Well, certainly the horseshoe arches, the decorative plasterwork, that's called yeseria in Spanish. I think that must be a word descended actually from the Arabic, surely. Very much you'll see the geometric pattern tiles, and in particular colours. They obviously didn't have access to all the colours of the rainbow, so you'll begin to notice that there's blue and green and black and white and ochre particularly, often embellished with gold, or at least in a palace like the Alcazar, it might be. Then this pattern of the rooms leading one to another through archways, and corridors which open out into little patios. And in the gardens too, the geometric patterns, the fountains and the pools. And by extension, the Arabic influence is all over the Spanish language, again particularly when talking about things like buildings, because as you've just been hearing, the Muslims were seen to be master craftsmen, people that you would encourage to work with you if you were designing a new palace. And so it is that in the Spanish language, many words to do with tiles and gardens and carpets and irrigation, all these words have an Arabic ring about them. Just one example, you'll see the word azulejo a lot, A-Z-U-L-E-J-O, which means tiles, the particular sort of coloured tiles that you see a lot of in Seville. And that comes directly from the Arabic word as sulaj, which means little stone. A useful thing to mention, maybe, when finishing the episode about the Alcazar, which, as well as being possibly the most beautiful building in the whole of Seville, if not southern Spain, although I haven't been to the Alhambra, so maybe I'll reserve judgment until I have seen it, but it's certainly a building in which you'll be very aware of the Islamic heritage of the city. <laughs> 
I think in the end, the main reason to go is just that it is so stunningly beautiful. And if I may quote The Lonely Planet just briefly, I couldn't put it better myself. So they wrote, quote, If heaven does exist, then let's hope it looks a little bit like the inside of Seville's Alcazar. Yes, quite. Thinking ahead to next week, we've dealt today with the fusion of two of the great religious traditions in Seville, namely Islam and Christianity, with really much more of a focus on Islam, as befitting the Alcazar. Next week's episode, I'm going to stick with Christianity and introduce the third very important religious group in Seville's history, namely the Jews. So we're going to look at a couple of different places, the cathedral to start with, obviously a Christian construction which dates from the time after the Reconquista, and which in fact was built on the site of the mosque which the Muslims had built in Seville. Except that this being Seville, it's not quite that simple, because right next door to the cathedral, you have the Giralda, which was the minaret to the original mosque. They left that standing. The mosque had been badly damaged by an earthquake, and so that seemed a good reason to pull it down and build a cathedral. But the Giralda wasn't damaged, was deemed to be very beautiful, and so why not leave it? So again, this mix of cultures. And then the other place that I'm going to deal with in next week's episode is an area of the city, the one called Santa Cruz, which translates as Holy Cross, of course, and sounds therefore Christian, but which in fact is the area of Seville which was formerly the Jewish quarters. So again, this idea of peoples and religions and traditions all mixing and fusing is going to be continued going, in fact, I think, to be a theme through the whole series. Okay, so all of that to come next week. For the moment, I'd just like to thank you very much for listening today. Muchas gracias. And to sign off, in Spanish, of course, by wishing you goodbye. Adios. (laughs) 